Hi everyone, this is EDIT 5100, Chapter 5, Technology Tools to Support the Teaching of Math. So the first thing we want to talk about is addressing the needs of students with disabilities when it comes to math. Well-constructed math apps can provide repeated practice with focused feedback. So imagine, you know, when you were a kid and you were doing math classes, you had uh, a book and then you had, let's say, 100 problems, right? And the teacher would usually say, do all the even ones or do all the odd ones, right? But now in this world of technology, you can do the same thing, but with an actual app itself. And it can actually be even more fun because a lot of them are very game-based or game-like. Be, uh, be can be customized to meet individual needs, provide sufficient repetition, and systematically present materials. So I want you to do right now is to stop this podcast. I know we just started, uh, but look at this link right here so you can see um, what uh, we are talking about when it comes to math uh, and technology. With the lack of simulation, difficulty in memory, auditory processing, visual perception, language, internal motivation, and attention. So for a person with a disability or a person without even a disability, you know, math can be very, very hard for people to remember the, you know, what to do. Um, they don't necessarily understand what is being told to them. Maybe they're looking at the math problem, they just don't understand it. They don't understand the language of math. Um, they don't really feel motivated, kind of like they're gonna say, well, am I ever gonna use this in my real life? Um, and all that stuff can be very, very, uh, typical for a person who is learning about math, right? So that's something that we want to focus on when it comes to students with disabilities and their math focus. So there's educational apps like we talked about before, computer software programs, apps for tablets and mobile devices, and interactive web-based activities. When educational apps are accessible by a variety of methods, such as with a keyboard and a mouse or a touch interface like a tablet, they can, use, uh, they can be used effectively by a greater number of students. Again, uh, before it would be write it on a piece of paper, but the thing is not everyone can write, right? Because of their mobility issues. So instead having, let's say a tablet where they can actually do the exact same thing will be very, very helpful for, the, for those specific students. Good gross and fine motor controls can access most educational apps. However, if only a mouse or only a keyboard can be used, it could exclude an entire group of students. So you want to consider when you have a specific student with their disabilities or abilities, um, what is the most uh, practical ones that you can use, which requires you as the instructor uh, or the aide is to vet through some of those apps or programs to see if it's something that is useful for your student and uh, attention getting and engaging and stuff like that. Desirable features of educational applications. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how people design specific software or games or programs that are educational and what are the co uh, components of it that they always have to pay attention to as an engineer for this. Uh, simplified screens and instruction consistent placement of menus and control features, graphics along with text or support uh, to support non-readers and early readers, audio output, spoken instruction and auditory feedback, accessibility by a variety of methods, uh, ability to set pace and difficult uh, level of difficulty, inappropriate and unambiguous feedback, and of course, easy error correction. I know I just read you a lot, but we're actually gonna explore each of those in the next couple of slides. So um, let's explain each of these things so that you have a better understanding. Simplified screens and instruction. Students can easily discern the important elements and identify where they should focus their attention. Not distracted by or confused by graphics, Animations that are not integral to their learning should not be there. And then simplified instructions allow students who struggle with receptive language and follow multi-step directions. So let's look at the sample image right here. So right here, it looks like um, an app to teach someone how to write the number nine, right? And so for you as a viewer, you're, you know that the controls at the bottom are going to go back and go forward. The top is top left is a redo button. The right side is the you know, number button, maybe the category, so it lets you know. The question mark means that if you have questions or you need help, you can press that. And on the left center is a jar with the number 12, which basically means you have 12 points. So you know that as you are drawing the number nine, by following the little arrow, you're catching these little bugs that you're gonna probably end up putting into the jar. And you do a circle, and then afterwards, most likely you're gonna draw the line down, 
right? So it's a very simple screen. It's, there's not a lot of distractions on this. The main focus is the number nine. And so you're going to draw it and then go down and then you're probably going to get points. And then you would probably click on the lower right hand corner to go to the next number so you can learn how to write it. So this is a very simplified screen and the instructions are really uh, not something that you need to know how to read to be able to play with this game and learn from this game. All right, consistent placement of menus and control features. We've talked a little bit about that in the previous slide, but let's continue on here. Easier for students to remember where they need to point and click on a computer. Tap or touch sensitive screens to engage appropriately with activity. So if you look at this example right here, we know that the, the visual problem will be on the left side in the water, right? The actual math problem is the top middle, right? And then the right side is the number or the answer that you're supposed to select. So for something like this, I can envision the game going, there are uh, one alligator in the pond and there are three frogs in the pond. How many animals are in the pond, right? So if that was what the, the, the audio for this would be, then the student hopefully will choose four and then they might say, great job, or you are correct. And let's go to the next problem, or it might just go to the next problem, right? So for something like that, it's very consistent in the placement, so they can always look to the left and then know that the answers that they have to choose are from the right, but they can also see the visual math representation in the top middle. Graphics provided along with the text. Enable non-readers and early readers to engage successfully with educational apps. So this is very similar to students who not, don't necessarily know how to express themselves. Um, so we have a, like a smiley face chart or a smiley, angry face, sad face, laughing face, crying face, because sometimes students don't know how to read. So they can't really express themselves in those ways uh, by writing and stuff like that. So instead they can choose it because they recognize facial uh, features, right? Like, how are you feeling today? Are you happy? Uh, or whatever it is, and they might choose a smiley face, then you know, okay, they're happy. So the same thing is happening when it comes to a math-based complex uh, concept, which is this is not a time for teaching them how to read. This is math, right? So we're focusing only on math. So if they do a math problem correctly, maybe a happy face will show, show up. If you have something that's like a sad face, then maybe they're like, I'm confused. Why is it sad even though I got the right answer? So you definitely need to choose the right image to go along with it, the graphics to go along with your math so that the student is re, um, uh, reinforced with doing the correct thing. Picture cues can provide the scaffolding needed by struggling readers, offer access points to students with difficulty reading directions or text-based navigation controls. Energy and concentration is used to learn content rather than devoted to figuring out what to do. So having all of this allows them to just focus on the math problem and nothing else because this is all about just math. There's also audio output. Allow students who are struggling or non-reading or students who are auditory learners access to content and benefit from spoken instructions and feedback. So for example, it'd be like, you know, when you start the program, they're going to say, hey, are you ready to do some math? Let's do some addition. And then, um, you know, then that's say they play the game and then the response back is, that's right. You're so smart. Let's go to the next problem. All those things are considered hourly audio output and instead of having a teacher there for every student having an app that has auditory uh, feedback like that will facilitate independent working on themselves right so understood more easily because it bypasses reading weaknesses and addresses their strength again this is a math class or a math assignment not a reading assignment um, so you want to focus on the math concepts instead because if a child can't read and they can't do the math homework then what's the point? They, they actually have, are now behind. Spend energy and cognitive resources on learning concepts, adjusting their strategies, incorporating feedback. So again, all these things might happen. If let's say the student does the uh, math problem and it's wrong, they're gonna go, uh-oh, I don't think that's the right answer. Do you wanna try again? And then um, they can try again. And then they say, that's really great. You did it on your second try, that's fantastic. And then let's go to the next math problem. So something like that will encourage them, hopefully as a student to continue forward. And you know how you used to do the math assignments on a piece of paper, you had to do like 50 problems instead. They'll do a hundred problems on a computer because it looks like a game, it's fun to them, okay? 
pace. Pace is the speed at which students are expected to respond or to initiate interaction. So you know how we talked a little bit about when you're in kindergarten to like third grade, you're kind of learning to read, like you're just learning how to read. But after that, you're learning uh, information from the reading. And so pacing is something similar. Now that you know the concepts, let's see if you know how to do it you know, at a faster space, uh, pace, because that means that you understand the process. You're just trying to get the, the, the information out now. Students who find it difficult to execute a quick response will be left, uh, will benefit from adjusting uh, adjustable response rates, which means for some people when they're still learning about pacing, having a clock will make them nervous, will give them anxiety. So you wanna turn off that clock so that they understand the concept, they're familiar with adding, let's say, and then once they're familiar with that, you can put a, a timer on there, let's say, let's see how many problems you can do in a minute. And then, you know, then there's a clock and that teaches them to be faster in pace and also basically kind of like more fluent, okay? Uh, pace would also mean the speed of progression from one concept to another or one level to another. Appropriate and unambiguous feedback. When feedback is provided to inform students whether an answer is right or wrong, it is important that the feedback be delivered clearly and in a manner that students will understand. Auditory feedback or graphic feedback are good for non-readers along with the text. That's correct, you're on a roll. So those things will motivate them and let them know that they're actually doing the right thing. Incorrect answers should be delivered with kindness and sensitivity. You don't wanna go, uh-oh, you're stupid. That answer was wrong. No, you might reduce the interest and motivation over time and provide a, a better way would be to provide a hint or a prompt to correct the answer. So what that might be instead is, uh-oh, um, that doesn't seem to be correct. Can we try again? Or I know you can do it. Let's do it again. Let's try it again. Something like that. And that way that student is encouraged to continue on because if they're constantly being put down by the feedback, which is you're stupid, you're dumb, um, they might go, well, maybe I am dumb. And why am I even trying to learn that? Explanatory feedback is designed to help students understand why an answer is incorrect and why an alternative answer is correct. Will lead to transfer of knowledge to novel situations. So that means like, let's say in the real world, if it happens where you're like, oh, wait a minute, that's not right. Let me do it again. As opposed to, uh, I don't even know what's going on anymore. I'm just gonna stop, right? And you wanna encourage them to retry over and over again to get the right answer. Feedback for correct answers should always be more stimulating and rewarding than the feedback for incorrect answers. So when you get an uh, a correct answer, you might go, yay, and there might be like a little smiley face on the screen. But if your wrong answers are funnier or cooler looking, people are going to purposely get the wrong answer because they like that stimulus more. And it's actually happened because of poor design. If the wrong answer is more stimulating, they may purposely choose wrong answers, and then that's not the purpose of learning, is it? Easy error correction. When input is accepted immediately, students have no opportunity to change answers or correct mistakes. Imagine when you're taking an exam, right? And then you are uh, taking, let's say, a multiple choice and you chose B, but after a while, you're going through the rest of the test, you're like, oh, wait a minute, that answer was really C. So then you go back and you fix it. And you're like, yes, that's good, right? However, for some programs that are designed, once you put in the number, um, it automatically lets you know wrong or right, but maybe the person goes, oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong answer, let me correct it, but it's too late. Or let's say that person with a physical disability, let's say that they, they uh, have tremors and they press the wrong button on the keyboard and then they get the points wrong. They're, they're really not getting it wrong. It's just because their disability is actually preventing them from getting the right answer the first time. So definitely when you create an, uh, an app or find an app, you want one that says submit or something like that because then that allows the person who is taking the test or the doing the assignment, the power to go, okay, I'm ready now to show you my work, okay? If error correction is burdensome or time consuming, students with disabilities may not be able to correct their answers. This will make the teacher assume the student has not mastered the concepts or understand the assignment. When really they do, it's just their disability prevented them from showing it to you accurately, right? Teacher selection. The learning activity naturally fits uh, instructional goals or objectives and meets the interests of the student. So definitely when you are choosing apps, uh, programs, games, and stuff like that that are educational, you wanna make sure that they are uh, motivating and engaging for your students. 
It's not a force fit. Employ a user center approach when selecting educational apps, which basically means if you were a student in this position, how would you want to learn uh, math concepts? Match with the student's IEP goals to keep up with their curriculum. Teachers should select educational apps with specific outcomes in mind. Teachers tried out educational apps before adopting them. And vendors offer demonstration versions or free trials. So when you go on an app uh, store, like let's say the iPhone App Store or the Google Play Store, um, they have a version called LITE Lite. Um, and that usually is maybe the first level or something like that. You want to try it out and see if you like it or not before you purchase it, let's say. Setting educational uh, applications focus on math. Number one is automaticity and fluency. Remember the quickness. Once you learn how to add, you want to start learning how to add faster, right? Because we have more complicated things in algebra for them that they need to figure out and understand. So adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing should not take very long. And so games will help you with the automaticity, so they automatically just do it, or the fluency, which is they understand exactly what that math problem looks like and they can do it. Two is visual spatial organization. Three is understanding math concepts such as number sense, time, measurement, and money. And then four is solving word problems. And we all dread the word problems, right? Because sometimes the information in a word problem is not actually important for the math problem. So it's something that students need to learn how to do. Um, right now, I would like to ask you to stop, uh, pause here, and then look at the Math Evolve uh, YouTube video. Because what it is, is about a fourth grade math teacher who invented a, a math game that looks kind of like a space odyssey. It's really fun. So please stop and then watch that and then come back and then go to the next slide. All right, automaticity and fluency. Uh, let's explain all these different concepts again. The effortless completion of basic math facts with speed and accuracy. Quick and easy recall of basic math facts. Second grade is addition and subtraction and third grade usually is multiplication and division. Uh, computational fluency. Computational basically means being able to uh, uh, process a, a problem. Able to efficiently and accurately carry out procedures to to solve computational problems in the third grade. Your goal is to be able to fluently add and subtract within 1,000 and fluently multiply and divide within 100, okay? So you want to have them practice this so often that it just becomes natural for them, right? And that's what we were doing when we were doing math problems on a piece of paper, when we were doing like 50 math problems and stuff like that is to, to increase the automaticity and the fluency of that student. Fifth grade, you want to learn how to multiply multiple digits, whole numbers, using the standard algorithm. Relies heavily on automaticity and basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, division number facts. And if they don't develop the math fact fluency, they'll be uh, at a disadvantage with higher order mathematical concepts such as algebra. So for some students with disabilities, maybe having a, a, a a table like this image right here that's included on the slide will be really helpful because let's say that they do have a memory processing uh, issue, having this will not put them behind or maybe even a calculator or a talking calculator will be helpful for them because they probably demonstrate that they understand the concept of it, but for some disabilities, they're really slow. Uh, and so you want them to be able to not fall behind more than they already are by giving them these guides because they understand the concepts, right? It's not cheating because they already understand what they're doing. Tools to compensate for lack of math automaticity, like we said before in the previous slide, addition of multiplication charts or calculators. Um, what is the primary purpose of this activity? Is it for computational skills or is it problem solving, exploring number patterns and working with data? So what is the purpose of this math lesson today? Is it to understand what adding means or is it just to get the answer so that you can move on to something else? Again, depending on the math lesson, um, you might have different purposes. So for some students, um, an accommodation would be a calculator calculator and that is totally fine. Technology-based activities that address automaticity and math fact fluency. FAST, F-A-S-T-T, Math Next Generation, is fluency and automaticity through systematic teaching and technology. Assesses students' command of basic facts by measuring response time and then generates customized activities based on the results. Auditory and visual instructions so that the student can look at it but then also hear it. And immediate corrective feedback so it shows you how to correct something uh, or the correct answer immediately. And teachers can monitor the student's progress because it provides you with statistics, basically. So um, I want you guys to take a second and stop this uh, lecture and then go and explore the FAST website uh, link that I provided to you on the side. And once you're done, go back here and then we'll continue with the lesson. 
There's also Times Attacks, which focuses on multiplication facts, high-tech video games environments featuring high-quality graphics. There's a free version for download. And there's also Archademic uh, Skill Builders, Develop Automaticity in Addition, Subtraction, Multiplication, and Division. There's a free version that's not customizable. There's a paid version, collects data on students' uses and achievements so that you can keep track of it um, and stuff like that. So I'll just go to the next one if you want to explore either one of these um, programs. There's also Math Fact Master flashcards and challenge for basic operations. So it's very easy if you look at this really quickly. There's adding, subtracting, multiplication, and then dividing. So, and then you can see how all the buttons are there. So it's kind of like a flashcard. You go three plus three, you press six, and then it automatically goes to the next one. Once a math problem is solved by the student, touching the flashcard will flip it around to see the correct answer. The challenge mode must enter in the correct number. So again, this is again a, a math problem game, and it's a uh, probably really engaging to a student rather than just writing it on a piece of paper. Visual, spatial, or motor control difficulties. Students with disabilities may experience difficulty in writing numbers, aligning digits in computational problems, creating visual representation. Think about long division, right? You really do have to keep everything right underneath the numbers to make the answers right. Have you ever done a long division problem where you're like, oh, wait a minute, is that in that column or that column? So that's something that some dis uh, students with disabilities will struggle with. And so that's something that we want to address with these math problems or math, um, math programs. Fine motor skills for visual and spatial words. Written work is difficult to read. Some may not be able to interpret their own written work. As students progress in math, they must solve problems with longer strings of numbers. Must be able to write numbers as fractions, decimals, percentages, and draw 3D figures. Draw letters, symbols, numbers, subscripts, and superscripts as well. So these are things that you would normally involve uh, in a math class, right? So what are some of the programs that help students uh, and people when they are not able, let's say, to do these things, accomplish them physically. Educational apps that address visual, spatial, and motor control difficulties. One is mat, uh, Mod Math and Panther Math Paper. Visual paper workspaces that are similar to paper and pencil, easy to correct alignment, and shows regrouping or barring or carrying. So if you look at this sample image right here, you can see it has a grid paper. And it's online, though, so you can now put it in there and move things around so that it's organized. And then you can also submit this piece of paper, uh, this digital piece of paper, to the teacher so the teacher can grade it. Mod math uh, is free. And uh, it talks about whole numbers, fractions, and decimals. Please take a moment right now to pause this lecture and then go into it. It's actually a really great video because it shows exactly how the grid paper works. And there are also some uh, pros and cons to all this stuff as well because we want to make it as simple. But then again, math is also can be very complicated. So we want you guys to see the pros and cons and maybe even suggest this for some of your clients in the future. Uh, Panther math paper is, uh, is similar. Adds a label such as miles per hours or money signs or dollar signs. Secondary window for scratch paper. And then it also has post-it notes there for teachers to respond. And you'll see that in uh, the mod math uh, example as well. There's also Microsoft Word. You can get difficult, but provide some basic math understanding. Um, there is Math Type, Advanced Math Classes, download and install a Microsoft Math, uh, math Add-in. So again, please take a moment and stop here. Click on the Math Type, and you'll actually see that there's a whole vast amount of stuff on Word that allow you to do all these different difficult math problems. So you can see in the image here, look at that crazy mathematical problem, right? If you click on the video or the link right there for math type, you'll actually see them demonstrate how to do this stuff. And it's all free. Um, the Probably the reason why they don't have it normally, or maybe they have it in the newer versions, is because it probably takes up more space for a person to download. And most people don't do math on there. So it's just an additional add-in if you need to. And then um, you can use it if you want to create math worksheets. There's also Scientific Notebook, which is a free download for a month, high-end applications that is designed to do more than allow users to write questions or equations on the computer. So it's designed to solve equations, advanced math, calculus, vector calculus, transformation, and matrices. Shareable with others who do not have it, and you can view the graphs. There's also Math Talk, which combines the Scientific Notebook, which is a previous program, allows students with disabilities to verbally express any math from pre-algebra through PhD level, combined with Dragon Naturally Speaking, which is a 
speech to text uh, software. Students can input math calculations in the computer through verbal dictation. So math talk is basically recording a person saying like three plus five equals eight. And all of that will actually show up on there if a person cannot physically write. Printed and then turned in just like other students. There's also EFOFEX. I'm not sure if that's how you say it, software. And basically that's created for teachers by teachers. And you can see right here is an example of all these different things that you might want to use in your class, but you don't necessarily know how to reproduce. They have already done it for you. And they're sharing this information. Construct geometric figures, write equations, create uh, graphs, and produce statistically correct images. Students with disabilities get it for free if they're interested in using it. Math concept skills and problem solving. Uh, understanding the underlying math concepts is key to enabling students to transfer their knowledge to solving unique problems. And that's a problem I think a lot of students who don't like math do, is that they actually don't understand the underlying math problem. They're just doing it because they have to do it. And this is why I think maybe America is also lower when it comes to math skills is because we know how to do it. I hear a lot of people say, I passed math. I just didn't understand what I was doing at all, right? And that partly is a, a major issue when it comes to math. What is the purpose? Math is a universal language. It enables us to do everything. You're using a computer because math was involved to create your computer, right? Um, but for some people, they just don't understand the underlying problem um, or the underlying, I'm sorry, math concept. And that can be a problem. Um, so that's why we want to address that as well. Value of using manipulatives to teach math concepts and develop understanding is widely accepted. So manipulatives are basically products, right? Little things that children can play with, blocks or Legos or whatever, so that they can understand the underlying process of it. But for some people, they cannot play with the physical, so they might have to use the digital. So there's actually digital versions of manipulatives as well. Uh, Hands-on experience can help students with disabilities understand abstract math concepts, and there are virtual manipulatives that you can actually do as well. All right, National Library of Virtual Manipulatives, NLVM. There's Computing Technology for Math Excellence, and I've hyperlinked all this stuff if you want to explore it. Some of the programs are no longer in use because, again, uh, technology goes out, budgets go out, so then people don't support these things. But um, the first one is an explanation of information relating to virtual manipulatives. There's also Internet for Classroom. It's a free web portal designed to assist anyone who wants to find high quality free internet resources to use in class instruction and to reinforce specific subject matters uh, areas at home. So this might actually be really great for students um, who are at home right now because of our COVID-19 coronavirus epidemic pandemic. There's also virtual laboratories and probability statistics, which is more advanced probability statistic programs. There's also math playground, learning math concepts, skills, problem solving. It's free math games, word problems, and then logic puzzles. And they have common core levels that they match along with. If you're thinking about common core and I haven't talked about it, uh, math playground will actually match up with it. So that'll be really helpful for some of you guys. Online Learning Centers is free. It's a media center with video recordings, explanation of individual concepts. There's Math Review, provides visual step-by-step -step reviews of concepts. Personal Tutor narrates as he or she provides a visual demonstration. And there's also a multilingual glossary. Math Learning Center helps build confidence and develop their mathematical abilities. There's free apps, there's eight of them. Most common manipulatives used in a classroom to develop early math concepts, such as number lines, patterns, shapes, and geoboards. And there's also Classroom Suite, which is a math tutor, second and third grade math, and then virtual manipulatives, such as coins that they can play with, blocks, number lines, and then also grids as well for them to digitally play with if they don't have physical ones or they cannot play with physical ones. Educational applications for teaching functional math skills. Some math apps are designed for students with cognitive disabilities. There's the attainment company. The apps cover computation, money, and time. These are some of the games that they have or programs that they have that you can use and explore and see if it might be helpful for your specific students. Equals curriculum, research-based mathematic curriculum designed for students with disabilities kindergarten through 12. Three levels of instruction for mild, moderate, and severe disabilities. So again, I encourage you guys to explore this program to see if it maybe helps with your students uh, with autism or whatever it is. There's level one, which is pre-emerging academic skills in the simplest form. Level two is beginning to intermediate academic skills. Three is low vocabulary demands to meet the highest level of complexity for any given object. 
authoring applications. So authoring applications basically means you're going to create it yourself. Allow teachers to add their own content to create customized activities. Spoken instructions and feedback, so you'll record those things as well. Uh, unable to use handwriting to practice skills and demonstrate knowledge. And then unable to manipulate materials physically, so you would create your own lesson. There's Clicker 6, which teaches you how to learn how to count or recognize shapes or perform early math skills. So if you're actually interested in designing stuff, this stuff can actually make you a ton of money. Um, and if you know Common Core and you can work along with that, hey, this is a possible gold mine for some of you guys who are really inventive and creative. There's also Geometer's uh, Sketchpad, third grade through undergraduate college, virtual manipulatives that elementary students can use to explore fractions, number lines, and geometric patterns. There's also ratios, portions such as algebra for middle school, and high school Sketchpad to explore geometric shapes like geometry and stuff like that. Um, and then there's also Learning Grids, which again is hyperlinked here, free teacher-created activities. So teachers have already created this and have donated to this kind of online uh, website that hosts all these things. So please feel free to explore. Like right here, it says, what is one more than four, right? And then you would probably click five, if I understand the problem correctly.